Hi, my name is Megan Anderson and I serve down here in SCY and this is why I serve. I serve because I really, really believe in the importance of youth ministry. I believe that youth is full of your people that are going to be pastors and leaders and missionaries in the future and business owners and kingdom building moms. And I believe that youth sets up the foundation for how the trajectory of their life is going to go. And I know that for me, my youth pastors and my youth leaders were really influential in my life. They made a big difference. They invited me over for spaghetti dinners and they gave me books and they prayed over me. And so that had a big impact on me growing up. And I love the fact that like, I get the opportunity to do that now for students and to be able to be in their world and pray over them and talk to them and give them biblical advice like when they ask for it. So I really love all those things about youth ministry and that's part of why I serve. I think that using my gifts can sometimes feel scary and make me feel a little bit anxious at first, but then when I do step out into those things that feel hard or scary, I know that the Lord is with me and I know that we are God's handiwork created um, in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when I step out and I do those things, I feel like a peace that the Lord is with me and that He does have me prepared for this moment and to get to know these students specifically and serve in this ministry. I think there have been so many blessings from serving. The biggest one would just be the relationships and the friendships, like not only with the students, but with the team that I serve with. Like, it's just full of great people. And definitely, I feel like my faith has been strengthened too, because as you meet and get to know students and you're praying with them and you're talking to them about struggles that they're going through, and then the next week or the next month, when you come back and you talk to them again and you see that the victory that they've walked through in those situations, your faith is strengthened as you hear like what God is doing in the lives of the people around you. So there have been so many blessings. You just never know the impact that you could have on a student's life. Like every student is different and they have a different story and every leader is different. And so there are always different students that need to be connected with and reached. And you might be the person that is able to reach a student in the way that the other leaders might not be able to be. You might have a story that might speak to them specifically. And then other areas of ministry also, it's just a great way to build community and to get to know the other people in this church. And I love it. I feel like it's been really rewarding. And to me, it's a really important part of what church is about is being the hands and feet of Jesus. Welcome. Wake up. Wake up. I don't know about you, but I got mad this morning when my uh, alarm clock went off. I was just mad at whoever invented daylight savings time. So here I am, and here you are, uh, the maybe uh, early risers, but not the smart people. Uh, the smart people are still sleeping. So, uh, but uh, I'm excited for today. You know what's what's amazing is is our our, our students are right now uh, getting ready to come back home. Uh, we got a picture yesterday uh, from Pastor Manny uh, of our two. Uh, you would think. Uh, well, you would know that they're siblings by the way that they act because they are like exactly what siblings you think of that don't like each other. That's what my two uh, oldest are, my son and my daughter. Uh, but we saw them praying together. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's just something that God does when they get away uh, from the mess, when they get away from the technology, when they get away from that stuff. Uh, and we're just thankful for the youth ministry. We're thankful what God's doing there. Amen. Amen. Well, before we get in, here's what I want to do. I want to see how close you are with the person next to you, and I want you to shake them and tell them it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. So let them know. We'll see how comfortable you are with the person next to you. But uh, we are continuing on in our series, uh, The Heart of the Church. Uh, this has been, I hope that you've enjoyed the, the, the series so far. Um, we have already last week uh, Pastor David, he brought the last message in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, and I think he did a great job last week. Uh, and now we're actually going to tra transition uh, into 2 Timothy. Um, and so before we jump into the message, I want to give a little bit of context, a little bit of history, so we understand where we're at. Because although we put these two books into one sermon series, 
these two letters could not be kind of more farther apart in the way that the, the tone and the setting of everything that's going on. So just a little bit of a context. Number one, uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are a page apart. So you turn that page, but by turning that page, we're actually advancing about six years. So we're going from uh, one, 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 1 Timothy to 2 Timothy, six year span here. Uh, things have gotten very drastically different drastically different. Um, when, we look at, uh, when we look at the New Testament, what's amazing is, is that our kids right now are learning uh, the New Testament in kids' world, uh, the, the books of the Bible. They're learning uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians. Let's see here. First uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Did I say it right? Or did I see my father-in-law shaking his head no. Am I doing good? Did I miss Colossians? I said Galatians twice, didn't I? Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1, 2, and 3 John, Jude and Revelation. Did I do good? I did that to show off, but apparently it failed Miserably, so don't air that one. We'll, do, we'll put the second service on YouTube uh, when I go back and look at it again. Uh, but uh, what, what, when we look at that, we actually do see something interesting. Uh, we see that we have 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus. But the reality is, is that uh, 2 Timothy is actually the last letter that Paul writes. So it's actually not chronological, so it actually would go 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy. Um, and so why this is important is this, is that uh, Paul now, his life is completely in dire stress. He is now in a place where we will, the, a lot of people call this Paul's farewell letter. This is the last time that we will see Paul's pen touch paper in scripture. Paul has written about two thirds of the New Testament and now this letter is the last thing that he is going to write. Now, let me ask you this question. When we were kids, uh, we would ask each other, we played this game where we would ask each other, if you had 24 hours to live, what would you do? And our answers were always different. Some would say, I'm gonna go to Disneyland, I'm gonna sneak in for free. Or we're, I'm gonna go and we're gonna go to every single place that we can possibly eat at and we're gonna do all these things. Like me, I was crazy. I was like, I'm gonna go rob a bank because that just sounds fun. I'm gonna be dead tomorrow, so it is what it is. Like, but my question for you is, if you had 24 hours to live, what would you do? Well, here's what's interesting is that we find Paul in that very position. He has more than 24 hours, but it's not much. We actually know that after this letter, it's not far long after that, Paul is beheaded and killed by the emperor Nero. Uh, we've heard about Nero a few times, but I wanna kinda give just how evil he actually was even, even further. We've heard about the, this fire uh, that, he, that he started uh, in Rome, but I don't, you know, the reason he did that is pretty impressive. Uh, the reason that he decided that he wanted to start this fire was he actually was trying to kind of rejuvenate, uh, rebuild Rome. Uh, and the government of that time told him, no, we're not going to do that. We don't have the, the, the money to be able to do that. And so what he did was he goes, well, I'm going to have it anyways, so I'm going to start this fire. And this fire burns it up. And now what he wants happens, but now he doesn't want the heat to come on him and what he does is, is he, he, he starts to put the blame on Christians. What this does is this puts a target on the Christian's back. And Nero adds fuel to the fire because he begins to start slaughtering Christians in the middle of the street. It's even said that he was so terrible that he would take Christians alive, he would dip them in tar, and he would put them on a stake, he would tie them to a stake and he would burn them in his garden like torches. This is where we find Paul because now Paul is in prison, but he's in a, he's more than just a prison, he's in a dungeon. They say that if you actually go to where he, where, where that, that place is right now uh, in the Holy Land, that you actually see this, like just this, this hole in the ground that he was put down into, there would be a lid that would be put on top of it that, and then a hole in that that would, that would be able to give him the food. Paul is alone. Paul is cold. 
and he has very limited time left. And what does he choose to do? He choose, chooses to write an encouraging letter to his friend. I don't know about you, but that's the last thing I'm thinking about doing. But this is where we find Paul. Paul is writing to Timothy, this son of his that he's found in the faith. And so we're going to jump in today, and we're, I'm going to have to zoom through some stuff today because we got a lot to cover. But what I'll tell you is this, is that this message, uh, I, I told my wife yesterday, I'm very excited to bring this message because as I was reading this message, I started to get excited because I felt like God was speaking to me. Those are the most amazing messages when it's not just something that I get to bring to life and, and teach, but this is more one of those things that I promise you this, I'm going to get loud. I'm probably going to sweat. But more than that, I believe that God has a word for each and every one of us in this room today. And so I want us to buckle up and I want us to get ready. And we're going to fly through this thing, but at the same time, we're going to take some time to talk about this. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 1, it says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Let's stop right there. The first thing that we see here is pretty normal for Paul. Paul is giving this greeting. He's, he's writing this greeting to Timothy, and he's saying, hey, here who, here's who, who has appointed me. God, his will has appointed me to be this person that I am and, and who's writing to you today. But then there's something that changes that we don't see very, very often from Paul. And it says this, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. See, what Paul's saying here is he goes, I know that my time is coming, but I'm looking forward to the promise of life that's in Jesus. Jesus gave his life. I'm looking forward to that. Paul is in a dungeon, and he's saying, I'm looking forward to what's next, because I know that my time here is not much longer. And then he jumps into talking to Timothy. And when we look at, when we, when we look at Timothy, uh, excuse me, at Paul, and what, what he says to Timothy, he says, hey, this is who I, I've served Jesus. I know this, and here's what I want you to know as well. I am remembering you in my prayers. Aren't we thankful for praying people? You know, Kim was just up here. That's my sister-in-law. We love her. <laughs> but here's the truth. She's right. She's a praying person. I've seen her pray for people. I've seen her on her knees. I've seen her be that person. And here's the truth is that I know that there's people here today that you're the same. Aren't we thankful for praying people? And here's what we know is that Paul was a praying person. Paul must have had a list, and, and Timothy was on that list. And who else was on that list? I don't know, but I know this. Timothy's on the list. And then he says, I'm, I'm recalling your tears, and then I'm going to be able, when I see you, I, I would love to see you again. It would bring me joy. Paul knows that that's not going to happen on this side of earth. This recalling of the tears is probably from, a t from the time that they last met when he knew that Timothy knew, I'll probably never see you again. But what do we see from Paul? Paul is telling him, I'm praying for you, and I can't wait to see you again. And then he talks about this faith. And he actually says sincere faith, which is like a genuine faith. And he says, this faith was in your grandma and your mother. Now, real quick, just a little bit of background on this is that uh, Timothy's mom and grandma were Jews. They were believing Jews, which means that they were Jews who found faith in Jesus. His dad was a Greek, which means he was probably not, he was not a believer. And in those days, the dad was kind of, this is how we do things. This is the way that things work. And so what happens is, is that the mom and the grandma of Timothy have done whatever they can to help Timothy understand that this faith matters, that he needs to have genuine faith. Can I ask this question? 
Who here, you had maybe a, a praying grandparent or mom or a dad that just prayed, and you know they were praying for you? You are a product of a praying person. What's interesting, if you've been here, I've probably told you this story before, uh, but it's just my story. It's just the way that it works. But uh, when I was a little boy, my grandma was that person. We, we, we didn't go to church very often as a family, but when we did go to church, it was usually with my grandma. And my grandma Ruth was her name. We called her Mima. And Mima would call us all the time asking if we wanted to go to church. And we would always say yes because she learned something. She learned that I am a fat kid. And she learned that if I take him to KFC, his love for fried chicken will have him come to church. Now, here's what I know is that that worked. And I still love fried chicken today. You know, I don't know if my grandma knew what she was doing and how far it would actually go and take me. But here's what she knew. If I can just get him to Jesus. And I'm going to say this today for us. Timothy is a prime example of a praying grandma and a praying mom who will do anything they possibly can. Dads, we're in this together too. But for the sake of what, what we're talking about today, Paul is literally calling them out in their faith. And Timothy has been a recipient of that. And now he knows that this is, this is where, and I, I just want us to understand this, is that we have an opportunity to be praying parents, to be praying grandparents, to be praying friends, to be praying aunts, uncles. We have an opportunity because here's what I know is that when I went, I was going for the fried chicken, but when I was contemplating killing myself, here's what I know, that seed that was planted when I was a little boy was there. It changed everything. I don't know if my grandma knew that, but I'm so thankful for a grandma who chose to get me to church. So here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, do whatever it takes. If it's a happy meal, give them a happy meal. Let's get them to Jesus. Let's get them to church. And let's be praying for them. Amen? This is our, this is our job. And Paul is commending this. Like, think about that to be in Scripture for being somebody of sincere faith. It's just amazing to think about. Then he jumps into 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 9. It says this, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. I love this right here. Number one, I love that word remind. Let's just go to where Timothy's at right now. Timothy is in a place where he's probably not doing everything he's supposed to be doing. That's why Paul's writing the letter as well. And so he's going, I'm reminding, I want to remind you to fan into flame the gift that God has given you. That, 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 that thought of fan into flame last night, we, we, we did a, a little uh, bonfire thing. Uh, we tried at least. But here's the truth. I've been there and I've seen it where the fire begins to dwindle, it begins to go down. And what do you have to do to get it to, to come back up. You have to fan it. You have to get some air on it, some oxygen on it, and that helps it build itself up again. What Paul is saying here is, is that not, bro, you're not doing a good job. Timothy, what, what is, get yourself together, man. No, what is he doing like a great spiritual dad should do? He's going, I want to remind you that God put a gift in you. And it might be smoldering right now. It might be small right now, but I'm gonna tell you what, if you fan it, if you get, here's the thing, is if we leave it undealt with, if we, let, if we don't do anything with our gift, it'll die out. That's what they do. If you don't do anything to a fire, it will die out. But when you fan it into flame, it begins to burn. And here is what Paul is saying. He goes, that gift is in you. 
Fan it into flame because you're going to need it. You're going to need to use it. I know it's hard right now. And here's what I'm going to say to us today is that there is a gift that God has given you. Every single person in this room, God has given us a gift. And your gift is different than my gift. His gift is different than her gift. But here's the truth is he's given you a gift to be used to help build the kingdom of God. Is that inside the church? Yep. Is that outside the church? Yep. God wants you to use your gift. And here's the reality is that we get to places where we go, "Ah, I'm not very good at it. Like I I can play the guitar, but it's not like great. I can deal with kids, but like they kind of get on my nerves a little bit. But, and here's the truth is that we talk ourselves out of the gift that God has given us. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying, don't talk yourself out of it. Fan it into flame. Build that thing up. Because that gift that I've given you is going to change the life of somebody if you're willing to use it. And so I'm standing here today saying the same thing. Fan into flame your gift. If you can sing, you need to be on stage. I can't sing. So that's why I stand down there. Whatever it looks like for you, whatever it looks like for you, this is the opportunity that we have to serve the kingdom of God. Can I tell you, your gift isn't for you. Your gift is for somebody else. But if you're holding on to it and not using it, what are we doing? This is... This is what Paul is saying to Timothy because he knows that Timothy is in a tough place. And then he says this, he says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. Another word here is fear, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Also, another translation would say sound mind. God has not given us fear. Fear does not come from God. So how do we defeat fear? The first way to do that is to know that it doesn't come from God. And just to make sure that we understand how we can fight that, God gives through Paul's words three things that can help us. Number one, he says he's given us a spirit of power. Is that our power? No, it's his power. What that means is is that when we walk into situations, when it's scary, when there's fear, when, when I'm a little timid, the power that I walk in with is him by my side. He's walking in this with me. This power is not to control others. This power is so that we can get through the difficult seasons, the difficult times. So then Paul says, just to make sure that we understand that he's clear This isn't about you. What is this about? He says that that God gives us a spirit of power and of love. That seems like it's out of place. Just gonna be honest with you. Like if I'm trying to defeat fear, I don't think that love is is the answer. But Paul says it. So when you do some studying, you actually understand what this means. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying love for others. You wanna defeat fear? How do, we, how do we control, how do we use this power? We love others. How do we do that? By serving them. We serve people. I don't know about you, but there's different ways that you can serve. You can serve in the church. You can, you, you can, you can, there's so many different things that you can do. You can serve in kids' world. You can serve in the worship team. There's a lot of different things that you can do. But also, you can serve outside the church. We have that opportunity with the iHeart Lower Valley. I will say this, they were being really kind to you by saying, you can't, hey, just show up. There's only like 30 spots left. And when I look at the roster, I see some of Sila. And I would love to see more. So I'm pleading with you, come be a part, to walk this thing called love out. But what about this? What if there's, there's one more area that, What if serving others actually looked like this? Because you gotta use your gift. What if using your gift was to be, I don't know, maybe like a coach or a teacher? Maybe your gift is to be, the way that you can show love to others is to go mentor a kid. 
There's a lot of different things that we can do that don't have to, we've got it so twisted in the church that it has to be, my gift has to be used in the church. But can I tell you something? There is a world full of kids who need a good coach who loves Jesus. Maybe it's me just doing some stuff in the business world where I can come in and I can give a little bit more and I can be an influence and people will ask me, what's different about them? And we can say, I just love people. And then, what does Paul say? He says, power, love, and a sound mind. Self-discipline is another one, is what it says here. But what that means is, is that it's your thinking. You have to be willing to defeat fear. You gotta be willing to say no. God doesn't give me the spirit of fear. This isn't coming from him. Where's it coming from? I'm gonna think logically. I'm gonna think spiritually. I'm gonna think the way that God wants me to think. This is how we battle fear. And here's the truth is that the next thing we see is, is Paul says, so don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of this. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed. Can I be honest with you? I've been ashamed as a Christian. And usually it comes back to, I, I care so much about what someone else thinks that I don't want, so I, there's times where I'm like, ooh, like if I tell them I'm a Christian, will they think I'm a weirdo? Just me? But Paul is saying, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed. Here's the truth is that we get ashamed about a lot of things. The last thing we need to get ashamed about is a loving Savior who came and gave his life so that we can inherit heaven forever. That's something we don't need to be ashamed about. But here's Timothy, ashamed. Paul says, don't be ashamed even more. Why don't you just join in the suffering with me? And when I say that word suffering to people from the United States of America, the first thing that came to my mind about suffering was I got two bars on my phone. There's no Wi-Fi here. And here's the, here's the truth is that we can think of suffering in different, I know those are just fun and there's some, Matt, I'm suffering. I'm suffering. I can't pay my car bill. You have a car. Paul and Timothy during their time for being a Christian have an opportunity to have their head taken clean off. That's suffering. As a Christian, maybe I'll get made fun of, but that's not really suffering. That's just part of being a Christian and going, it's okay. We suffer with him because of the gospel. Timothy's helping, or excuse me, Paul's helping Timothy understand something, that this thing matters so much that you're gonna go through some stuff. And when you go through some stuff, it's okay because you're doing it for the one who matters. It's okay. And then we see in this last part, it says this, it says, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. I love that. I love the fact that before I was ever thought of, he was thinking of me. He was thinking of his plan for me. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know who I'm, whom I believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until, the day, until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith, love, in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 
you know that everyone in this province of Asia has deserted me, including that guy in Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of that person because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how much, in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. This grace that we get from Jesus. Can I tell you something? Whether you want to believe this or not, Jesus Christ is a real person who died on the cross, who defeated death and the cross. We've done a really good job as the Western church of really making the cross easy and simple, but here's the truth, is that it's not. What Jesus did on that cross was horrific. And what Paul is saying here is Paul is saying, I'm going through suffering right now. I'm going through some things right now. I'm in a dungeon right now. I'm going to be killed. You might be killed, Timothy, but guess what? It's worth it. You might lose some friends. It's worth it. It might be difficult. It's worth it. You might lose out on some fun. It's worth it. The gospel is worth it. What Jesus did on that cross is worth it. And here we are. I don't have Wi-Fi. Here we are. I'm getting sick and I'm tired and all. My job, I'm suffering because my job isn't paying me what I thought they should pay me. But it's worth it because here's the truth, your job will not do what God will do and what he's already done. Here's where it got me when I studied this. You might be going, Matt, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not suffering. Those are the things I thought of. When we're at the house and everything is on the internet and it goes out, now I can't watch TV. Now I gotta play with my kids. Suffering. I had a rough day, suffering. I gotta give something up, suffering. And I, I heard God speak to my heart and he said, it's worth it, man. It's worth it because you are worth it for me to go to the, the cross. And here's the reality. He'll go to the cross over and over and over and over and over again for each and every person here, but he didn't have to because he defeated it. It was a one and done. And he's saying, it's worth it. Giving up that stuff to follow me, it's worth it. Giving up that stuff to help someone else is worth it. Giving up your fear of using your gift is worth it. But the reality is, is that we use church as a check the box type of thing. And we gotta get past that. We got to get to a place where we get uncomfortable, where we get our hands a little dirty, where we might go to places that we wouldn't normally go because the gospel is worth it. But I love how he ends this. Because he goes, like he literally must be someone who like nobody wants to be around, Paul. Because like he doesn't say like a city he says like a whole like province. He said like, hey, the whole province of Asia. They all kicked rocks. They're out. They left. But he must have really felt hurt by the two that he named. Because he says that their name, like would you like to be in scripture for the rest of eternity known as somebody who like left Paul? No. Nope. But then Paul says, there's this person, Onesiphorus, that sounds right. We'll call him Mr. O. 
And when I read this, it hit me. Paul needed it. I need it. You need it. We just need somebody who's willing to be there for us when no one else is. And sometimes we can be somebody who is there for somebody when no one else is. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there where it feels like everyone's left. It feels like there's nobody left. All we got is the two of us. But then people start to pop their heads in and they start to bring encouragement. They start to bring. And what I love about this is, is, is it talks about this guy and he, he literally sought after Paul. We need people and we need to be people who search after people to love them and to let them know, you may have made a mistake, but I'm here. You may have messed up, but I'm here. You may feel alone, but I'm here. I don't know about you, but that goes a long way for me. And so how do we end this day? We got a couple minutes left. Here's how we end today. We worship. We worship. We just say thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. I have a heart of praise and a heart of gratitude. And this is for you today. So I'm gonna ask everybody just to stand up today. And I'm gonna ask you to worship with hearts abandoned. Amen? Let's worship together.